very much, Mehdi. So, as Mehdi said, my name is Marcus, and today I would like to talk a little bit about the fundamental shift, the fundamental change that the web is currently undergoing, the, the shift from strings to things. And I will explain what I mean by that in a couple of minutes. But before we get started, I think it really makes sense to bring to mind how big the web actually is, because that's kind of a, a big reason for the problems we are struggling with. So right now, the web is roughly made out of one billion websites. And those one billion websites consist of 60 trillion web pages. So that's a whole lot of uh, information that's out there. As a matter of fact, the web, as we all know, is the largest distributed system that has ever been built. And it's also the largest information management system that has ever been built. So there is really nothing that you can't find on the web. So in fact, we are kind of drowning in data. It's really a huge amount of data out there. But even though we can find almost anything on the web, it's still very difficult to leverage that information. So we could say that even though we are drowning in those massive amounts of data, we are still kind of starving for information. So it's very difficult to extract actionable insights from that data. It's very difficult to make use of that data in an automated way. It's very difficult to extract the data reliably from websites out there. And just to give you a quick example, so for instance, if you are interested in like the events of a band, like the gigs where they are playing, what you normally need to do is you fire up your favorite search engine, then you uh, query, then you look for the band, you go to their homepage, the homepage you figure out the section where they list their events, and then you finally get the information you're looking for. If you want to integrate that with other data, you typically either have to, I don't know, hire an intern who extracts that data and puts it in a spreadsheet so that you can process it further, or you uh, use a screen scraper or something similar. And there exist quite good tools these days to create screen scrapers quite easily. But the problem is that if you do that, you really have to do that again and again and again for every single website you want to get the data from. So that's something which doesn't really scale. And the main reason for that, at least if we're talking about websites, is that most data out there, most data that is on the web, is available just in an unstructured form. And that means, by consequence, that the data integration is completely manual. So you really have to go there, you have to read that uh, HTML document, you have to understand it, and then extract the data that you're actually interested in. Now, of course, since we are at the API conference, you would argue that you know we can also uh, exchange structured data, so we can send around JSON documents. But if you think about it, uh, more about it, you will actually see that we are still kind of suffering from the same problems if we're doing that. So we still end up having quite brittle systems. So just as a screen scraper breaks when the structure of an HTML document changes or when the, the template changes, most API clients break completely if the structure of the JSON changes, even just slightly. So if you just modify it, even though the same data is there, you just modify the structure, and it will break completely. And again, same problem. You have to integrate with every single web API separately. So you can't build an application that then just works with every web API out there, which publishes the same data. So even if you have like three event uh, management APIs, you would have to integrate with each of them separately, even though they most likely expose more or less exactly the same data. And those are kind of the, the, the issues that uh, motivated us to work on an alternative approach. And the result came out in January this year. It's called uh, JSON-LD. It's a new W3C standard. And it kind of tries to address those issues by making all the information, all the data, machine processable, and to a certain degree also understandable to a machine. So if you go back to the example to that band's homepage, what they could do is that uh, they could express their uh, information, the, the list of their events, not only in like natural language in an HTML document, but they could also describe that in a JSON-LD document. And by coincidence, <laughs> they do that already. So if you go to their website and look at the source code there, you will see that they embed a block of JSON-LD into, in into their HTML document. 
But as you see, it's uh, actually quite idiomatic JSON. So you really have those usual key value pairs. Uh, you get uh, the coordinates of where the event happens, etc. But most of the magic happens at the very first line or the second line, actually. So it's something we call a context. And the context gives additional information to a machine. So it gives a machine enough uh, uh, additional data to make sense of the data, to understand what this document is about. And the principle is uh, quite simple. So what you do is you map those ambiguous string tokens like name or music event, that those English terms to unambiguous identifiers. And the best identifiers we have so far are URLs. The nice benefit of using URLs is if you encounter an identifier and you don't know what it stands for, you just put it in your browser's address bar and go and look it up, and you will get the definition. So uh, as you see, we really map all those main concepts here to uh, URLs. In this case here, really almost everything, so everything highlighted here, is mapped to a URL. So in fact, you could say that this is kind of hypermedian steroids, because you not only have like, like those usual links between entities, you also have the description of the entities directly linked to the definition of the schema, in a sense. And as I told you, if you don't know what a field means, you just go and look it up. So for instance, here we have something which is of type music event, as you see in the top. If you, if you don't know what a music event is, you just go look it up. So you would go to schema.org slash music event, and you would find out that a music event is a more specialized form of an event, which again is a more specialized thing than a thing. And that's uh, why I said from strings to things in the beginning. So it's really trying to uh, make, it, uh, make the data understandable to a machine. So instead of having just natural language strings, which are kind of meaningless tokens to a machine, you really have some uh, concepts and represent them in a form that the machine can uh, process automatically. So what we have here effectively is uh, kind of a shared vocabulary. So it's really kind of trying to establish a language between uh, the publisher of the data and the consumers of such data. And as long as they speak the same language, as long as they use the same vocabulary, they will immediately understand each other. The nice thing about this vocabulary in particular, about schema.org, is that it was created, and this does, of course, also understood by the four major search engine providers, so by uh, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and uh, Yandex. And a whole lot of other companies do support schema.org as well these days. So as soon as you start publishing your data and marking it up with schema.org, all those guys will immediately understand your data. They don't have to integrate just with you or with another website, it's kind of, uh, you get all that integration almost for free. So to put this a bit more into like REST terminology, what you're doing if you're using uh, JSON-LD and the vocabulary such as schema.org is you make your messages self-descriptive. So that means all the information that you need to understand in, uh, uh, in a message is really contained in the message. You don't have to go and read some additional documentation just you know, to figure out uh, what that message is all about and how you can process it further. So as soon as you have that, as soon as machines are able to understand what the data is about, you can really do fancy things, really nice things. So for instance, in this case here, we had the band which described their events in a machine-readable form. Uh, that means that other people, such as Google, can index it. So when you now do a Google query for that band, so if you search for Preacher's Son events, they will show you the events straight ahead. So you don't even have to go to a web website anymore. So you really see some uh, of their upcoming events right, uh, right at the, uh, on the result page. But if you click on one of those results, they can even go farther and show you a bit more information about that event. So as you saw before, they had the coordinates, so they can show you a map. Uh, they integrate with other data they have, so they also show you a link to the club, which is there. So it's really easy for them to create much more uh, engaging user experiences if they understand what that website is actually about. And obviously, it doesn't stop with websites. So emails, for, for instance, are also just HTML documents in the end. So you can also embed uh, JSON-LD data in emails. And airlines are using that quite extensively. 
So if you booked a flight to come to this conference, you probably got the flight confirmation email and the chances are quite high that the airline included, again, a block of JSON-LD in that uh, flight confirmation email. And if they did, Gmail is able to extract that information and show you a nice little summary of the flight that you booked on top of your email. And again, since they really understand what flight you booked, on which dates you booked it, etc., they can integrate it with other data they have. So they are now able to show you up-to-date information about the flight. So while the email, of course, stays static, so it doesn't change anymore as soon as you got it, they can still show you up-to-date information, like uh, which gate the flight is uh, departing or if it got delayed or cancelled. You can also take that information and index it. So Google is a search engine, after all, so that you can now start to Google for my flights as long as you're signed in. So they can show you your upcoming flights. They even take it a, uh, a step further, so they push all that information to your mobile phone automatically for you. So if you use Google Now, all that information is pushed to your mobile phone. And if the airline supports it, they even go and fetch the boarding pass for you. So you really have to do nothing than swiping your uh, phone as soon as you board the plane. All the rest can happen completely automatically. And that's something which would be, well, basically impossible if you wouldn't have something which is understandable to well, a certain degree to the machine. So if you would just have, you know, like plain old JSON APIs, they would really need to go to every single airline and integrate with them, etc. So it, it's a process which simply doesn't scale if there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, participants in such a system. So uh, till now, I more or less talked about how you can describe data, so static data, like giving data meaning, giving documents a meaning. But if we talk about web APIs, you are often also uh, interested in the behavior, in the functionality of the web API. You, you, you want to know how you can modify such data, how you can add new data. And uh, that's a, another project I'm working on. It. It's called Hydra. As you see, it's a bit more exciting if you're interested in web APIs. So Hydra is just a schema.org, a uh, a vocabulary, but it's a very small, lightweight vocabulary. So it defines just a handful of concepts, basically, whereas schema.org really defines hundreds of concepts because it really models kind of a lot of topics, a lot of verticals. Hydra, on the other hand, really focuses on RESTful web APIs and hypermedia-driven web APIs. So again, we don't have that much time, but nevertheless, I would like to show you a quick example of how it looks like. So if you have a web API, again, events management web API, and you retrieve a resource, which is uh, a list of the attendees of a particular event. So in this case, we uh, do a get on a, a specific URL, and then we get back a JSON-LD document. So again, you see there's a context in there, which does the mapping. We have an identifier. So in JSON-LD, all entities are identified with URLs. That means that other people can start referencing your data, which again means that you get integration basically for free. In this case, uh, we get back a collection, so it tells us what this entity really is. An entity, uh, sorry, a collection, of course, has a couple of members, and perhaps there are also a couple of other properties that we are not really interested in this instance here. But what you might want to do with this resource here is you might want to add a new attendee to that list. Now, with a traditional web API, that would be the, the moment where you would need to go and read some documentation. Well, first of all, you have to find the documentation, then you have to read it, and then you have to figure out how to construct the right HTTP request and send that off, and hopefully it works. With Hydra, all that information can be uh, put directly in the message. So you can say that this resource here supports an operation. It also tells you the type of operation, so that means it tells you what happens if you invoke that operation. In this case here, it's schema.org add action, which tells you that, well, if you invoke that operation, you will add something to this collection. If you don't like full URLs in the document, you can, of course, abbreviate them and map them in the context. Uh, Hydra also tells you how to create that request. So in this case here, it's an HTTP post and what data the server expects. So you need to send the server a person. If you don't know what a person is, well, it's just a URL again, just go and look it up. So in this case here, we have a person, it's a class, so you have to send an instance of a person. And in this case, we have just a single property, a single supported property, it's required, so you 
if you want to add an attendee, you have to send a person, to post a person to the server, and you have to at least include the person's name. And then uh, you can really start interacting with your web API. So what Hydra basically does is it kind of guides your client through the web API. So it really tells the client what it can do, how it can do it, and uh, this really means that you can generalize your tools. So it's really all the information that the client needs are just there. So you don't need to you know, depend on some external or additional information or additional documentation. And this uh, has a couple of nice uh, advantages. One of them is that you can really start to completely generalize your tools, your uh, applications, etc. So for instance, you can create completely generic API consoles. And as a proof of concept, we did just that. So we created something which we called Hydra Console. And uh, it's basically a generic API console. So it works a bit like a browser. So you enter the URL of one of the resources in your web API. It goes and retrieves that document. It then uh, uh, looks into the document, goes and fetches the documentation about all the concepts it finds in there. So in this case, it's quite trivial. There's just one property, so it goes and uh, looks to which URL this is mapped, and it goes out and fetches the documentation for that and shows it alongside the resource it got back. It also recognizes hyperlinks, also relative ones, so it's really because JSON-LD supports hyperlinks out of the box, so there's no regular expressions or any other magic involved. It's really first-hand, uh, first-class citizen in JSON-LD. If you click on such a link, uh, the Hydro console can show you a popover with all this, the operations that are supported for this particular resource. Uh, in this case here, you can either go and retrieve the list of events or you can add a new event if you decide to do so. Uh, again, the Hydro console will know what kind of data the server expects, just as I showed you before, so it can render a form for you. You then simply have to fill out that form, click on Invoke, uh, that, may, that will then trigger the J Hydro console to create a JSON-LD document for you, send it to the server, and the server basically replies with another document, and the whole uh, stuff uh, starts over again. So it goes out, fetches the documentation for all those things, etc. So effectively, you can really start using your web API as soon as you've implemented it. And it's also very trivial for non-technical experts to use an API this way, because they really see the documentation there. They just have to fill out forms, just as they do on websites. So it's, uh, it also helps you to build kind of better web APIs, because the non-technical experts, the domain experts in your company or your customers, can really start to evaluate whether what you built is actually what they wanted to have much sooner than if uh, you would have to implement a client or an application for them before they can even start to look at it, because they simply wouldn't understand you know, just how to create HTTP requests, uh, reading JSON, etc. Okay, so uh, that's uh, more or less all from me. If you're interested in this stuff, uh, go and check out our homepage. It's hydracg.com. CG stands for community group. So all of that is uh, being developed in the context of a W3C community group. So the goal is really to create another uh, W3C standard with this. Uh, JSON-LD was created exactly the same way, and then we brought it into W3C for proper standardization, and we hope we'll do the same here. So uh, join the effort, make sure that we actually build the right thing so that it also works for you. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. I don't know if it's a softball or a hardball. Uh, 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 how is this any better than soap? Uh, I mean, what features do you have that soap doesn't have? And, and kind of uh, it's not really about features or what features you have that you, SOAP doesn't have. It's kind of a different mindset, right? I mean, in SOAP, you have quite rigid uh, schemas. Uh, you have RPC calls, whereas here, it's really kind of you figure out what you can do at runtime and not at compile time. You could use SOAP in that, uh, in that manner as well, but no one really did. So it's really how you use it, and it's also in SOAP you didn't really have, well, you could use XML na namespaces, but 
I don't know, it's uh, like, uh, I would say it's a different mindset, a different way of approaching things. It's more lightweight in my opinion, but while effectively you can achieve the same things, yeah. And you get data integration uh, more or less for free. We have time for one other question. Um, so this is apparently based on the on the premise of a shared vocabulary. Uh, can you elaborate a bit of uh, about about the, how we can get to a consensus what things mean? What apparently when uh, Google says this is an event, maybe some other company thinks event is something completely else. So can you can you share a bit about you know the process of getting consensus to what the data means or what these terms means? Well. I mean, obviously, that's the most difficult part, right? To get consensus about what those things actually mean. So in, in the case of Scheme.org, really the four search engine providers, they sit together and started to, to work on that and came out with the first version. And nowadays, they, they kind of try to open, that, open up that development. So there's a mailing list, and you can submit proposals, and people will start uh, discussing them. And if consensus emerges, it will get added to uh, Scheme.org. Obviously, sometimes that's uh, difficult or even impossible. The nice thing here is that you are not restricted to just schema.org, for instance. So you can really mix and match vocabularies as you see them fit. So if, if you disagree with something, you just create your own vocabulary. If other people agree with you, instead of uh, schema.org, your uh, vocabulary gets more usage, and then it kind of emerges as a other, I don't know, pseudo standard or whatever. And that way, you kind of uh, get that level of interoperability that you need. But yeah, consensus finding is always the most difficult aspect of all of this. It's, it's less about the technical problems. It's more about the, the social processes, the social uh, issues uh, that make this uh, work uh, difficult, I guess. Another question? We have time for the last one. Last but not least. We have seen some interesting video from Google developers how uh, using, for example, schema.org can add stuff to the Google, Google Knowledge Graph and you can kind of join events as you were saying and so on. Could you elaborate a bit more how it kind of integrates to the Google Knowledge Graph? Uh, sorry, uh, I couldn't hear that. How, how uh, JSON-LD helps integrate with Google Knowledge Graph? Because I've seen some interesting videos that by marking up your data with, uh, for example, schema.org terms, they automatically integrate with Google Knowledge Graph. So they are not inside of the Google, you still host it yourself, but they seem like they were part of the same graph. Right. Um, so, I mean, as the events example showed, for instance, they really understand what the data is about. So they really kind of know exactly that in this case you're talking about a music event, they know what band uh, is playing at that music event, so who is like the the main actor, the uh, main, main act uh, at that event, uh, they use the, the same language in a sense, which makes it very trivial for them to integrate it. Of course, there is some you know, spam issues, uh, uh, data quality, data cleansing involved, but uh, it's, I mean, it's kind of the automated version of what you do with web APIs all the time. So you go and read the documentation, and then as soon as you comply with that, uh, it becomes possible to interoperate. In this case, the, the specification is kind of a vocabulary which you can mix and match, like you can pick the terms that you need to express your data, and if you use the same terms, the same URLs, then multiple parties will understand each other. And uh, that's the way they get uh, that integration going. I don't know if that answered your question, but... Yeah, okay, it answers the question. Good. He approved this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank, Thank you. you. Some applause.